Absolutely. And, you know, we have some folks who are just joining us now. Uh, you're watching VoteBex Live. This is our special DNC week uh, morning update. Every day we're here with elected officials, candidates for office, national security leaders supporting uh, Vice President Biden, as well as reps from the Biden campaign and from the DNC itself. We had a little bit of sound issue at the start, it sounds like. So Adrian Perkins is our guest right now, the mayor of Shreveport, Louisiana, and a candidate uh, for U.S. Senate this fall. Adrian, give us one more time, uh, since folks didn't get the audio the first time, the 60-second why you're in this race, why you're taking on Bill Cassidy, uh, and how you're going to win this thing. Okay, I'll try to sprint through it. So I'm the mayor of a city. I saw a lot of uh, destruction due to COVID-19. A lot of our gains in my first year were wiped out. And I realized that our uh, national elected officials, uh, not only were they absent in this time of crisis, but they have been harmful during this time of crisis. If you look at the way that they've politicized a pandemic rather than allowing uh, local leadership to, to point to experts and allow experts to guide us through this crisis. Uh, so it was similar to a moment uh, when I observed the Twin Towers during 9-11 on feeling like I needed to do something greater to protect my family and my community. So I stepped up in this moment uh, to run for Senate and challenge those that are harming my community in Washington, DC. Uh, we'll win because, uh, and we know we'll win because if you look back to just last year, our, our Democratic governor won here in Louisiana. And if you look on the faces of Louisianians, you see the frustration that the hardworking families are going through knowing that the uh, the rent mortgage moratorium is over, that the unemployment benefits are expiring, and that people in D.C. aren't helping them when they need the most. Those two things will converge at the polls in November. Absolutely. Now, as you mentioned, the reason that we're doing this uh, convention virtually this week is because of an unchecked pandemic, uh, a public health crisis that's taken more than 170,000 American lives and has destroyed uh, our economy and hurt towns and cities just like yours all across the United States. Talk a little bit about what it's like uh, as the mayor who's on the front lines of this pandemic. What are the consequences that you've seen from the fumbled federal response that we've had uh, on the president's side, but also on congressional and Senate Republicans in particular who are holding up the HEROES Act? Yeah, well, I I'll say my, my opponent actually has a very unique role that he's played in this. The president assigned him to be on the task force uh, to determine whether or not we had a national approach to this or whether or not we had a piecemeal approach and states kind of go about it the way that they feel is, is correct. And uh, my opponent being a medical doctor and sh he should have known better, but instead he said states should do it. So the piecemeal approach, I think is very much one of the reasons why this pandemic has ravaged the United States for as long and in the manner that it has. Uh, what I've seen on the ground here is that uh, initially when this virus was rolling itself out um, we, and we were trying to figure out exactly what it is, how it's being transmitted, was that there was more space for me to react because my governor, the West Point grad I was referring to earlier, he had a very strong response. So we followed the state's guidance in lockstep. And it was helpful coming from the state because it was uh, a very collective issue. So I have a sister city of about 70,000 beside us in Bossier. They had to follow the exact same guidelines. And uh, what we seen was Shreveport became the, uh, we actually made the New York Times list for the community that had the slowest viral spread. We were number seven in the country, uh, but that was because of messaging. We talked about the disproportionate impact on urban and minority communities early, and we put resources in those areas that needed the most. And we used technology as a big part of it to help us kind of geolocate some of our cases and figure out where those things were con concentrated. So we had extremely strong response up front. Everything was going well. The, the virus spread, viral spread was slowing down. But again, that piecemeal approach as numbers in Texas and numbers of states all around us, we're in the deep south, started to skyrocket as our numbers started to come down. Um, all the gains that we had um, during that first wave were quickly wiped away. And now we're experiencing a second wave uh, that's not only had heavy, heavy implications with the loss of life, but it also has had even more economic implications. And the businesses that have been affected the most are the smaller Main Street businesses, those those locally owned businesses that didn't have as much cash on hand as the massive corporations. And we've seen them try to kickstart too early because of the politiz politicization of this, this uh, particular virus and saying, oh, we need to open up the economy. We've seen them try to start up too early and they're not having enough foot traffic and not having enough customers and eventually being uh, having to close their doors permanently. Uh, so the 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 um, 
mishandling of this has been um, has just been tragic for our community on so many fronts. And and I mean, I, I'm I'm disappointed. I mean, I'm disappointed so much to the fact that I've jumped in the Senate race and I want to be able to represent the voices of Louisianians right now who are also disappointed. Absolutely. I mean, you know, in addition to the challenges that we're facing at home today, pandemic, uh, health care front and center, we've also seen some serious damage done over the last three and a half years to our standing on the world stage uh, and our national security posture around the world, uh, whether that's been degrading military readiness at home, stealing money, uh, for military families to build a racist border wall uh, on the U.S.-Mexico border um, or ceding to the strategic interests of people like Vladimir Putin on the world stage. You know, what would you bring to the Senate when it comes to national security issues? What would your focus be and why do you think it's so important that we put uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House to be making those situation room decisions come January? Yeah, so for, I mean, first and foremost, you know, if you're a veteran, um, I just don't know how you uh, can can turn a blind eye to the, the 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 things that you've pointed out that have been super harmful to those men and women that are in uniform today. Uh, I take my experiences, one of which that I, I explained earlier on my experiences in Iraq and my experiences in my two tours in Afghanistan, and I would take that to the Senate and knowing how important our allies was. There was no deployment that I've ever been on where our allies weren't weren't right beside me on patrol, right beside me in command centers, um, leading the way right beside us. So you know how valuable our allies are when they put their lives, their treasure on the line uh, to support American and global interests. Um, So it's no way we should be turning our back to them. And it's also no way that we should be cowering to those that we know are doing harm to United States troops. We gotta face that head on, we gotta have courage in those moments and that's something that all veterans have we know we've been in posi- the military definitely put us in positions where we've had to show courage in times where we're afraid and you don't see much of that out of dc one of the things i'm really looking forward to with the biden and, and harris ticket is uh returning some civility and deference to our service members uh some of the the rhetoric that has come uh, out of the white house is unfortunate uh, and it's something that's unprecedented we've never seen um, such disregard for the service that our, our veterans are, are putting in every single day over there. And um, yeah, we, we just need to, that tone needs to change quickly if we want to make sure that our veterans are being taken care of as best as possible. Absolutely. Now, uh, one more question before we, before we go. Um, we'll make it two questions, actually. The first one, I want to I get your, because you're in a state where you're talking to Democrats, you're talking to independents, you're also talking to Republicans. Um, There's been a lot of discussion about the fact that uh, John Kasich, former governor of Ohio, and other Republicans are going to be talking at the DNC this week about why they're supporting uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris and trying to get Donald Trump out of office. From your lens, as you're talking to Republicans and and voters who may not have voted Democrat in 2016 or even 2018, what are you saying to them and what's the response been as they look at this election? Yeah, when I'm talking to Republicans, I'm talking about their interests. Um, just because you are a D or an R does not mean that there isn't common ground. As a, most, as a matter of fact, most of the time there are common ground. Uh, right now, there are Democrat and Republican working class families that don't have unemployment benefits. They very much need those unemployment benefits to get through the COVID-19 pandemic. And we have a Republican senator in Washington, D.C. that's voting against them at every turn. Uh, So it doesn't matter, especially not during this time of crisis, uh, what political party you belong to is trying to find somebody that has a track record of showing that they'll put their the people that they're serving first, that they'll go to D.C. and fight for their interests. And uh, my opponent doesn't have this. So that's that's how we're talking to a lot of the Republicans here. And they're listening. Um, A lot of uh, a lot of our health care system, a lot of our doctors, our nurses, are Republicans as well, and they feel neglected in this time of need. You talk about the much needed HEROES Act funding that should be going down to them that could have been paying for PPE, a much faster response that could have got the PPE that they needed to protect themselves. Um, and they they feel that over a thousand doctors and, and nurses and, and frontline healthcare workers have died in this country fighting on the front lines of this pandemic. Uh, so they feel neglected and um, they're very receptive to our messaging. Uh, our challenge right now is to just make sure that, uh, you know, we get enough endorsements and we get enough funding to get our messaging out. We're seeing we're seeing as soon as we put that messaging out and the voters of Louisiana know that they have a viable candidate, 
that they're very much uh, switching their, their, their town and they'll vote for a D. Absolutely. That's great to hear. All right. Final, final question. Uh, tell us someone that you're looking forward to uh, hearing from during the DNC primetime lineup this week, and then tell people how they can get involved and support your campaign, even if they are not in Louisiana. Gotcha, gotcha. I'm looking forward to Stacey Abrams. Uh, and, and the reason why I'm really looking forward to Stacey Abrams is because Stacey Abrams was on the front line of this voter suppression issue, which we're seeing every single day in the news uh, with the um, attempted undermining of the U.S. Postal Service, um, you know, the, the messaging that, oh, mail-in ballots are fraudulent, despite the fact that our service member ha members have been using them for decades. A lot of seniors in our community rely on them. So I'm really looking forward to uh, Stacey Abrams and, uh, you know, kind of being that prophetic voice about voter suppression and the messages, the very important messages that she'll put out uh, to this to this country on why we need to really be paying attention to that uh, over time in this election. And everybody that wants to get involved with this campaign, please go to PerkinsForLA.com. Uh, you can don up, donate, you can sign up to, uh, to, to phone bank. Uh, and we need as much help as we can get uh, because we are on a very short timeline. But we know as a team, not just staff, but as a team with you all joining uh, our mission that will be successful. So thank you so much for the time, Will, this morning. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. And thanks, uh, thanks ahead for supporting this campaign. Absolutely. Mr. Mayor, Mayor Adrian Perkins of Shreveport, Louisiana, running for U.S. Senate in Louisiana this fall. Thank you for joining us. Good to see you, my friend. Catch you soon. Awesome. Now, for those of you just joining us, you're watching our Vote Bets Live DNC Week special coverage. Every morning, we're bringing you national security voices, elected officials, and others to talk about why we need Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in the White House this fall. Next, we're going to turn to two retired senior military officers who are supporting Joe Biden for president, General Paul Eaton and Admiral Mike Smith. Uh, you may know these two. Uh, Mike is a retired U.S. Navy Rear Admiral who commanded the John C. Stennis Carrier Strike Group and was the division director for the Navy staff responsible for Navy strategy and policy. He was also actively involved in organizing retired admirals and generals in the 2016 campaign and continues that effort and believes that national security leaders have a responsibility to advocate for change and help convince undecided voters in swing states that they need to vote for Joe Biden. And Paul Eaton is a retired major general who served more than 30 years in the U.S. Army, including combat and post-combat assignments in Bosnia, Iraq, and Somalia. Paul's assignments included command of the Infantry Center at Fort Benning and Chief of Infantry. He also served as the commanding general of the command charged with reestablishing Iraqi security forces in the early phases of the Iraq War. And he's a familiar face to many of you because he serves as a senior advisor to Vote Bets. Gentlemen, thank you both for being here. It's good to see you. Thanks, Will. It's great to be here. And uh, there we go. I mean, it looks like Paul's a little bit <laughs> sideways, but we're going to fix that. Um, now, I know that the three of us are all on the same page when it comes to Donald Trump's record. At this point, I think, you know, something we're going to be saying this week a lot, Mike and Paul, is it's not hypothetical anymore. It's not about hyperbole. It's not just about disrespect. He has a real record as a failed commander in chief, and it's had real consequences for you know, our military personnel and for our national security posture around the world. So I want to talk some of those specifics and we'll lean on your um, combined expertise. So Mike, starting with you, you know, as a retired admiral, you have a lot of relationships with senior military officers and national security leaders, people who served as secretaries of, of the services, assistant secretaries, et cetera. What can you tell us about the sentiment right now in that community when it relates to this election? Well, uh you're right. I, I do get to talk to a lot of, uh, you know, Democrats, but Republicans, independents as well. I think that uh, most of us have really gone through a journey, unfortunately, in the wrong direction. Uh, you know, we became really exhausted with his tweets. I think uh, many of us started to get very embarrassed uh, with the way he treated our allies. Uh, and I think in the end, we're just incensed by his lack of leadership. You know, we we saw, everyone saw what was happening with COVID. He had the opportunity to, to take hold of it and you know, become a strong leader from the White House and, and, and take responsibility and, and he failed. And now we have so many lives have been lost. And I think collectively though, if you talk to all of them, it all crystallized around Lafayette Square when he used military troops to go against 
our citizens who are exercising their their right to peacefully, uh, you know, express the freedom of speech. And so I think that all of us are ready for change and to bring back, you know, real integrity that uh, Joe Biden will bring to the Oval Office. Absolutely. Now, Paul, you, part of that, as Mike said, is that Donald Trump isn't a leader. You know, he doesn't even pretend to lead in the way that you train soldiers and officers when you were um, commanding at all levels in the Army. Now we're seeing the consequences of that, particularly with with COVID-19 and this public health catastrophe. When you look at the president's handling of the pandemic, his refusal to listen to experts, you know, what do you see from your lens as a retired general officer? Thanks, Will. Uh, President Trump doesn't see himself as a leader. He sees himself as a victim. And he complains endlessly that everybody is out to get him. And he refuses to take uh, the mediocre team that he has assembled and put them to work in a concerted effort to fight this major attack on the United States that is this pandemic. Now, it took President Lincoln a long time to find uh, Ulysses Grant. General Grant was, uh, was the man in the wings who was able to come in and, uh, and take care of the Union Army and execute properly. Uh, the military is our last line of defense. Every company commander that I've ever worked with, men typically 28 to 29, 30 years old, and their first sergeant, somewhat more seasoned, uh, know how to man, train, and equip to prepare for victory. Uh, they analyze the mission, they create the uh, team, they find the resources, and they move out. A couple of months ago, I attempted, when I saw the, uh, uh, the chaos that was going on in the White House, uh, I, I recommended that we admit that we've got to use the military. The military, the joint staff, is the finest planning body on the planet. Uh, these men and women know how to man, train, equip, plan for uh, anything that might uh, befall them. The execution agent, uh, the Forces Command Commander, General Garrett, has about 750,000 troops at his disposal to meet the needs of 50 state governors and five territorial governors. So this isn't rocket science, this is dual. We could have done this months ago, but uh, the president's failure to lead, the president's insistence that he's a victim uh, has put us in this uh, tight spot that we're in right now. Absolutely, now Mike, I wanna go back uh, a little bit broader than the domestic issues that Paul just hit. Talk about our nation standing in the world um, the damage that Donald Trump has done to our relations and the ways that he has bizarrely rewarded uh, our adversaries. You know, where do you, when you look at the way that the world views the United States right now, how much have we fallen because of Donald Trump's failures as commander in chief? And if you're Joe Biden and if you're his, his leaders who are put in office uh, and appointed after this election, what will it take uh, to get us back to where we were? You know, well, I, it, it's almost, the damage Trump has done is almost irreparable. I mean, this the way he has walked away from and embarrassed our allies. And like you say, I mean, he's embracing dictators um, at a time when the whole world is coming together to try and figure out a solution to COVID. You know, he's turned his back on the table. And, and you know, to me, there's no doubt he's made our country less safe than, than when we started. So, uh, I mean, the good news is on day one, uh, when Joe Biden walks into that Oval Office, uh, he will do so much to restore our standing. Uh, you know, world leaders will know that we finally have back in the White House, in the Oval Office, a leader they can trust, uh, someone with integrity. Uh, you know, Joe Biden, he's, he's a proven statesman. He has relationships with all these world leaders. He's gonna sit down with them He's going to try and figure out how do we restore alliances. And, you know, I, I think he's going to do more than that. He's going to he's going to figure out how we can find mutual interests and we can actually improve on our alliances. And we can look at the challenges and try and face them together instead of trying to go off and do everything on our own. Uh, Joe Biden's foreign policy is going to restore America to the head of the table. 
Uh, you know, and from there, he knows that we have to work together and together we can address global challenges like, like uh, you know, global warming and COVID-19. I think that's the answer and, and we need him in the Oval Office uh, in January. You're right. No, Mike, sometimes I think we don't talk enough about um, the, what we lose when chaos is ruling across the senior most levels of the executive branch across agencies. We don't get to do the deliberate work of figuring out how we can better deliver health care to military families or address climate change. I mean, there's real costs that come just from the erratic clown show that we've been living through for the last four years. Um, and Paul, I want to go to you now on some, something that might hit on a bit. Uh, you know, we've seen the way, especially in the last five years, that authoritarian leaders and wannabes like Donald Trump um, go about their business and try to move public sentiment. One of those is weakening institutions, um, weakening public trust in the media, something Donald Trump has done for years. Right now, he's engaged in an all-out assault uh, on the U.S. Postal Service as part of a ham-handed scheme to cheat in this election and prevent people from voting. What goes through your mind as you're watching this play out uh, as someone who's seen this in other countries? And what are the stakes, not just for the election, but for our democracy itself as this plays out? Thanks, Will. Uh, From a foreign policy perspective, uh, President Trump has uh, gone after very, very uh, important institutions that have helped the United States uh, achieve its place in the world. Uh, Trade agreements, the uh, NATO uh, alliance. Uh, th- this man is uh, is creating a, a world chaos. And my discussions with uh, my peer groups in Europe and in Canada and Israel, uh, their comment is, uh, "You have a real problem here." And it's not just Trump, but it's uh, it's the people who have bought into the Trump cult. And I find no other word to describe it. What he's doing right now in the United States, within our own institutions, attacking our military, attacking our veterans groups, attacking the Supreme Court, Congress, name the institution. He's going after it. And he's doing it to rupture the fabric of the United States so only he can bring the cohesion necessary in his own mind to, uh, to move the United States forward. We've seen this play out before. It doesn't turn out well. And I just have to tell you that uh, Admiral McRaven, who is a brilliant warrior and who chose to go into academia to transmit to, uh, to young Americans what he has learned over time, brings up just this point today in an op-ed in the Washington Post. And I encourage everybody to take a look at it. McRaven goes after what we're talking about right now, this dismantling of the institutions of the United States that have created this extraordinary country that connects us. And the post office, I go to my little post office here on Fox Island, and I talk to Ro, I talk to Terry, I talk to Leon. I know these people by first name. They're worried. They're worried from a personal perspective. 91% of Americans have a very favorable attitude towards the U.S. Postal Service, 91%. So I urge everybody, contact your senators, contact your representative, and make it clear what the U.S. Postal Service means to the United States. It's the only federal footprint that you will find in the smallest of towns as you drive across America. That is the federal example that we've got right now. So please get after it, get after your uh, elected officials. That's so right, Paul. I mean, another assault on labor from a man who's never worked an honest day in his entire life. Um, And 97,000 veterans who worked for USPS, uh, a great job for folks transitioning out of the military now with their livelihoods at risk. Uh, Mike, I want to barrel in a little bit on Russia in particular. Um, Paul hit on it too. I mean, one of the consequences, I think, if we look back to the disinformation, the spread of um, information intentionally trying to mislead people as they make decisions has led to some unthinkable things in this country, including the fact that Republicans are getting ready to send 
QAnon believers, conspiracy theorists, the fringe of the fringe, real dangerous stuff to Congress to hold office as elected officials. Um, when we talk about Russia, I want to get your thoughts, one, on, on what Donald Trump has done and how much damage he's done uh, to our standing in his fealty towards Vladimir Putin. And specifically, the idea that he wants to hold an in-person meeting with Vladimir Putin prior to the November election. What do you have to say? You know, I think it's an insult to the American people. I mean, look, how he has gotten away with not addressing what his own intelligence community is saying about what Putin has done to try and undermine the integrity of the election and and now he he hasn't even addressed the reports that that Vladimir Putin has given money to the Taliban as bounty to kill Americans, and now he's going to invite him to the White House before the election. What is is, is it going to be like a summit on voter suppression? I mean, hi Vladimir, how you doing? Great. I, I just defunded the post office. Yeah, great. I'm com completing my disinformation campaign. I think. This is an embarrassment. It's an insult, and we can't let it happen. It, it, it's just—it's. I'm speechless that he would even consider that. Absolutely. I mean, it's amazing to to think about how much the U.S. military, in particular, has put uh, financially, emphasis-wise, in trying to reassure our European uh, partners and allies uh, who are who have been under similar cyber attack and and you know literal you know military conflict aggression from the Russians going on decades now. Paul, I want to ask your thoughts on the same. I mean, the state of U.S. Russian relations and and what the president has done in ceding to Vladimir Putin. What does it mean? And what does it mean in the run up to November? Thanks, Will. Uh, I have worked with the Russian army. I have had exercises uh, with the Russian army post uh, uh, Berlin Wall teardown. Uh, they're very good men and women, very good men and women, very badly led by uh, Mr. Putin, who has a huge chip on his shoulder based on the, uh, the, the loss of his uh, country's empire. Uh, please recall uh, President Reagan, Anybody who was of age uh, in the late 80s uh, remember Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. I bring up Napoleon. Napoleon Bonaparte, uh, one of his great quotes is, uh, men are driven by fear and interest. I think both are at play here. Mr. Trump is afraid of something. And something is in the hands of Vladimir Putin. Mr. Trump has an interest. It's all economic. It's all about him and his family. So what is the basis of his fear? What is the basis of his interest? I really wish our intel community would find this out. Well said. Now, before we, before we close out, I want to ask one more policy question. We talked a lot about national security and, and international relations and our alliances. We've also seen some real detriment to our military readiness based on attacks by the president as commander in chief and his enablers, Mark Esper, I think being one of the worst, uh, on military personnel and their families. The transgender, uh, uh, the ban on transgender military service, uh, stealing money from military families to try to build a border wall. When you look at the issues, uh, Mike, that military personnel have faced over these last few years, what stands out to you? Um, and explain for people who might not know or don't come from a military background themselves, how harmful it is to go after those type of things, to go after money for childcare, to go after immigrants in a unit or women in combat roles. What has that done to our readiness as a military? You know, I think that, uh, the areas you ju you just mentioned uh, collectively, you know, show to me why at the end of the day, Donald Trump has failed as commander in chief. He's failed to take care of his people. He's failed to take care of his troops. You know, making like we talked about, making troops go after some, some innocent people who are 
peacefully protesting to, and violating their, their constitutional rights when, when those military folks were sworn to, to defend and protect the Constitution. You know, the issue we just mentioned with the, not even addressing the bounty we're going after and, and where Putin is, is encouraging and paying Taliban to kill Americans. The, the transgender ban you talked about. His administration is deporting, you know, undocumented veterans and you're not even checking the military records. And at, at the end of the day, he goes down to, to Mar-a-Lago and he listens to his, his rich friends give him advice on, on, on the VA so that they can put in these policies that, that take care of them and not the veterans. You know, fundamentally, Donald Trump not only doesn't understand, he doesn't respect the core values that the military is all about, with honor, courage, and commitment. You know, so when, when he takes funds that were supposed to go towards emergency response centers or go towards military family schools, and he diverts them to pay for the wall, he's, he's showing that he cares more about policies that really, let's be serious, that they're, they're designed to divide America, you know, rather than, than fund the military and their families and the veterans. That's why we've got to get Joe Biden in the Oval Office. You know, Joe Biden and Jill Biden, they're parents of a, of a son who served in Iraq. They understand what it takes to, to take care of, of our soldiers and our sailors before they deploy and on deployment and, and what it takes to take, to take care of their families, you know, when they're on deployment and when they come back from deployment, let alone the veterans. So I think that, that what Trump has done is to, is to undervalue and to abandon the military. Uh, and he just uses it as a photo op. So, so literally, he can go on a stage and embrace a flag and say, I'm an American, when really he cares about himself and not the military. Absolutely. Paul, your thoughts on personnel, the impact of, of going after communities in the military and military families and what it does to uh, the Pentagon's readiness? Well, Mike was very eloquent. Uh, <laughs> Civil military relations right now are the worst I've ever seen. And I uh, served on active duty from 1972 to 2006. Some pretty tough times during that, uh, during those uh, decades. So I will tell you that when he ambushed Mark Milley, chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff uh, in Lafayette Square, that was an absolute travesty. Mark Milley is a very good man, a very good man. I met him, I talked to him when he was a young colonel. Uh, I admire him greatly, yet he has a civilian chain of command that is problematic. Esper, a retired soldier, should know better, but doesn't. Tata, this guy who was a, uh, an embarrassment to the United States Army when he was a brigadier general, uh, is serving in the policy position. This is a terrible pair to run the Defense Department, a department of great nobility, populated by men and women who have sworn an oath to support the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Well, it's time to put in a real patriot. Former Vice President Biden and his wife, Jill, who as a team were very seriously engaged to improve the lives of a force that was really put under great pressure by the previous administration, uh, previous to uh, the Obama administration. So I applaud the vice president. I am voting for the vice president. I want to see him in the White House with his first lady, Jill. And uh, that is uh, what I am uh, working for, to see it on 4 November. Well said, all right. One quick question before we go. Name a speaker who you're looking forward to hearing from this week uh, in the evening DNC programming. Mike, we'll go to you first. Yeah, I really want to hear from uh, Kamala Harris. Uh, you know, I think, I think it's absolutely brilliant uh, to pick for the VP, and I think it's really going to energize the campaign, and uh, I really look forward to, seeing, to hearing from her. Absolutely. All right, Paul. Tammy Duckworth. 
a great American hero, a courageous woman, and uh, I, uh, I thoroughly expect we're going to see uh, much about her in the future. I echo uh, Mike's comment. What a great pick, uh, Kamala Harris, for, uh, for vice president to the United States. Absolutely. Thank you. you know, two great senators, great leaders uh, who are going to help us win this November and Kamala Harris and Tammy Duckworth. Polly, Mike Smith, gentlemen, thank you both so much uh, for your service to our country, for everything you're doing right now in the lead up to the election. We appreciate your time today and we're going to see you back here again very soon. Thank Thanks, you both. Will. Thanks, Will. And last but certainly not least, we're going to turn to our friend Leo Cruz, who is the Veterans and Military Families Engagement Director for the Biden-Harris campaign. Leo is a Navy veteran with years of experience in state and national issue advocacy and electoral campaigns. He has been on the job for a few weeks, maybe uh, over a month at this point, nonstop, and we are going to pull him in right now. But during the Obama administration, Leo served in DOD. He served in each branch of the military services uh, and is someone who has a ton of expertise on these issues to bring. And here he is. Leo, how are you doing? How are you doing? Good morning, Will. How are you doing? We're doing well. Hey, I like the TV. You've really, the setup is, uh, is improving every time I see you on a Zoom. It's getting better every day. It looks good. All right, Leo, as we start the week out, I just want to start broad. You're going to be with us every day. Uh, so that's a treat for the for the viewing public. We get to hang out with Leo <laughs> every day to close out the show. Um, Leo, start by telling us about the movement that you're organizing for the VP. Uh, well, now for VP Biden and Senator Harris around veterans and military families. What's the plan from now until November and how can people get involved? Yeah, well, and first, let me say thank you to, to you and your partnership. Let me just say thank you to Vote Vets for all their great support. Uh, veterans and military families are providing is a grassroots effort for our community to come together and show our support for Joe Biden and Kamala Harris in this historic fight to restore the soul of America. We're working across the country to gather veterans and military families of all political leanings, because no matter who, who you voted for in the past, Everyone wants to renew our nation's promise. Everyone wants an economy that rewards work and gives everyone a fair shot. Everyone wants to bridge the gap between where we are and where we can be, who we are and who we can be. And everyone wants to build a more just and democratic, kinder, stronger country, a better America. We plan on doing this with some good old fashioned campaigning in a virtual and socially distant model. Uh, that means hosting events like this with key leaders in the community, reaching out to our friends and neighbors by, by downloading uh, the Vote Joe app, and texting and calling them to make sure we leave no vote behind. Because I believe at this point, this is more than an election. As Joe says, it's a battle for the soul of our nation. And with fewer than 78 days left, we have to make every single one of them count. Absolutely. And Leo, what should people, you know, we have a lot of people who, who follow Vote Vets and are watching, who care about national security and veterans affairs issues. What should they be looking forward to this week in the convention lineup? Yeah, well, we have a great lineup throughout the week. Folks can look up the schedule at demconvention.com slash uh, speakers or schedule and speakers. Uh, and there's a whole schedule of partner events uh, throughout uh, the convention, as if we were still in Milwaukee going to hotel rooms for different conferences here and there. Uh, and so today I'm excited to hear from the Democratic Attorney General's Association uh, discussing the role of uh, policing and protest. Uh, they're going to have Minnesota's Attorney General Keith Ellison there and uh, interested to hear what they say about use of the National Guard and, and unmarked policemen uh, in Portland um, and, and, and those type of issues. Uh, tomorrow is a full day for me uh, where we have the DNC Veterans Military Family Council uh, meeting at 5 p.m. Eastern and then followed up by a pre-watch party at 8.30 Eastern. Uh, you can find all that on Mobilize. And then Wednesday, I'm looking forward to a discussion on gun violence in America, featuring uh, Representative Lucy McBath. Uh, and then Thursday, uh, our partners at Secure Families Initiative is hosting a discussion on why it's so important for military families to get involved in the political process and how they could do that legally and safely and, and, and creating a space for them to, uh, to get involved. And, and, you know, every day we'll have the main event on the convention floor. And uh, looking forward to how we're going to do this via Zoom. Yeah, right. <laughs> No, you're right. It's just like being in person, except we don't have to suffer through hotel breakfast, which is, uh, what, I mean, which means I have to cook, so it's not a good thing. But 
Uh, Leo, you talked about the primetime lineup, obviously. So 9 Eastern every night is when that two-hour block starts with the big speeches that, that folks have been looking forward to, of course, participate uh, in those breakout sessions throughout the day as well. Leo, can you take us through tonight's convention lineup uh, and remind people where they can tune in to see it? Well, as a, as a Norwich grad, I love to see Vermont Senator Bertie Sanders up there. Uh, we also get Nevada Senator uh, Catherine Cortez Mastos. We get New York Governor Andrew Cuomo, uh, the great governor from Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer. We get the, the legendary uh, South Carolina Representative Jim Clyburn, the convention chairman, Mississippi Representative uh, Benny Thompson. We get from Wisconsin, which is the home state of the convention, uh, Wisconsin Representative Gwen Moore. Uh, we also get uh, former Governor Kasich, uh, Alabama Senator Doug Jones, and uh, Minnesota Senator Amy Klobuchar. And last but not least, going to end on a high note with uh, former First Lady Michelle Obama. Absolutely. That's going to be awesome. All right, Leo, any other notes for people going into this week? Uh, just, you know, this is going to be a totally interactive convention. There's going to be plenty of places to watch. Um, and, you know, if you go to demconvention.com slash commit to watch, they have all the different ways you can watch it online, on your mobile device, on your computer, on your TV, on Twitch. Uh, I heard that's a gaming console that the kids know nowadays. Uh, and even as easy as saying, Alexa, play the Democratic National Convention. Uh, so there's plenty of ways to get involved, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, like you're doing here. Um, you know, it's going to be a great show. There's going to be tons. I, I cover the political stuff, so I'm excited about all the politicians. Uh, but, you know, there's going to be great acts, great actors, actresses, musicians, all of it. It's going to be an entertaining show all week long. Absolutely. And the best the best of all that, you can see Leo again here tomorrow morning. He's going to have a fun fact about Vice President Biden to share uh, with the class. All right, Leo, thanks for being with us this morning. And we'll close it out now. Thanks to everyone who tuned in. Tomorrow we'll be right back here at 9 a.m. Eastern with Congressman Seth Moulton former Undersecretary of the Army Patrick Murphy, retired Air Force Major General Trish Rose. Leo will be back and we'll also be joined by Ron Pierce, the Senior Advisor to the DNC for Veterans and Military Families will join us. We'll see you then. In the meantime, have a great day and don't forget to tune in tonight, 9 Eastern.